Good morning and welcome to Our Issues Milwaukee. I'm your host, Andrea Williams. We've got some interesting subjects to discuss today, starting with the Crown Act. It's been a little over a year since the state of California became the first state to sign the Crown Act into law. Crown is an acronym for creating a respectful and open workplace for natural hair. And here to talk about the Crown Act and her push to make it law, here in Wisconsin is State Representative Lakeisha Myers, who represents the 12th district in the Wisconsin State Assembly. How are you, Representative Myers? I'm doing well, Andrea. Thank you again for having me. Well, thank you for being here. And I'm really interested in having you um, educate the viewing audience about the Crown Act and why it was so important for you to introduce this legislation in Wisconsin. It was important for me to introduce the Crown Act in Wisconsin because it had started as a coastal kind of phenomenon. So uh, California was the first uh, after Senator Holly Mitchell introduced the, the Crown Act there and it was passed into law. Um, and after that, it moved to New York. So there was the New York Human Rights Commission that ended up passing the Crown Act. Um, it, New York was the second place that the P Crown Act was passed. However, nobody from the Midwest um, had introduced the Crown Act. And I was like, I wonder why not. Um, so, so we can be cutting edge and be first. Um, so that was the first thing. Um, the other part of it was, I think this is such an important piece of legislation because federally speaking, the only protected hairstyle um, for an African-American is the actual Afro. And mm -hmm. that was passed through federal statute by African-American men in 1976. Well, the world has changed and evolved in many different ways since 1976. And there are many different iterations of ethnic hair and that should not be something that uh, prohibits a person that is of, uh, from the African-American community um, as far as their employment status is concerned. We wear our hair straight, we wear it curly, you know, as it grows from our scalp, we wear it in locks, we wear it in sister locks, um, we wear it braided. I mean, you know, these are- The, the list goes just, on. <laughs> the list goes on. It's yeah. <laughs> it not be restricted um, be of something that is uh, pervasive in our ethnicity. Um, we shouldn't have that, we shouldn't have that weaponized, that part of us. Um, it was just another thing to have um, African-American hair be something that could be used against us in the workplace. Yeah, and so for many years, Black women have been told that their hair is unkempt, unprofessional, or a distraction uh, while in the workplace. So this is exactly why uh, you feel that it's important to add this legislation on the books. And there's a lot of interesting statistics when people really think about it. It's a lot for people to have uh, in the back of their minds on top of trying to do their job well. Black women are 50% more likely to be sent home from the workplace because of their hair. And 80% of women reported that they've changed their hair from its natural state to fit in a corporate environment. When you really think about it, why should anyone have to change what they're naturally born with in order to fit in to something else, right? Absolutely. I think that is, you know, spot on. When you think about um, all of the different industries, and I, I know uh, from a little girl, uh, you know, we all have, you know, nightmares of the straightening comb. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, where it was a weekly or bi-weekly ritual of you going to the hairdresser to straighten your hair because it was supposedly easier to deal with. It was more uh, conforming. It was, in, you know, so then people moved to relaxers. I did myself when I was in college. I had a relaxer up until probably about 2016. So, you know, even with going through that process, you understand and realize what you were doing to make yourself more palatable to Eurocentric standards. Now, whether that's a personal choice, that's fine. But whether it's something that's mandated in the workplace, I think there is a big, you know, uh, X there. Don't do that. That, that. I mean, I think it's just, it's another form of discrimination. And this is not the first time that we've seen that, even throughout history. When you go back to the, the early 1800s, the 1700s, in, you know, French Louisiana, you saw that mixed race women had to, you know, it was a part of the law there that they had to cover their hair and they were called Tignon laws. So when they had to cover their hair, of course, you know, we do everything to the fullest extent. Okay, we can't show our hair because it's supposed to be 
extra enticing to, you know, white men or whatever it is. So we then found beads and jewels and feathers and everything else. And we're going to wrap it up. But it's going to be, you know, you know, who can have the best wrap? You know, it's was the type of thing that happened there. So these are the types of things that have happened uh, throughout history, just in different iterations. There were, you know, for you're in broadcasting. There was used to be a rule that you had to have straight hair to be on television. That's true. You, you had to, you know, look a certain way or else you were not uh, palatable to a television audience. I think Oprah Winfrey talked about this with one of her jobs where she wore, you know, her short natural hair on television. And it was like, oh my God, you know, what are you doing? The same yeah. thing happened nearly 40 years later when you have Brittany Noble Jones, who was fired from, you know, her position on network news um, in Mississippi because she wore her natural hair and did not feel that she needed to wear a wig or some other type of, you know, uh, of additive to her hair. Um, so these are things that we're still dealing with. And it's interesting, you talk about Oprah, she did go on to straighten her hair. And if I remember the story correctly, it got burned out and she ended up having to wear a wig and that was a whole nother conversation. <laughs> so uh, there's, there's quite a bit and you mentioned the straightening comb. And so for those who you know want to look back on the history of hair because black women and natural hair and all kinds of uh, weaves and everything else. It's a billion dollar industry. So Madam C.J. Walker, of course, being the first African-American female to become a millionaire based off of the hair industry. So uh, like you said, there's a long history dealing with Black women and hair, but to uh, have your hair uh, be used as a way to discriminate against you is something that definitely should be dealt with. So you recently testified in regards to the Crown Act. Fill us in on that. So Senator Taylor and I recently, uh, we had two hearings. So the first hearing was at the state level. Um, and that was uh, with one of the assembly committees that was hearing about the Crown Act. So we got that far. We were happy to have a hearing because every bill that you know goes to a committee does not have a hearing. So this was very important. And you, if I can give you a visual. Here was myself, Senator Taylor, uh, Senator Johnson, uh, Representative Stubbs. So the four of us sitting there, all the only women that are currently legislators, the only four African-American women that are legislators. And we are presenting to a panel of predominantly white men and educating them on what ammonium thioglycolide does to hair and how it breaks down the proteins of African-American hair, wow. what health, what health, um, you know, uh, what health impacts that has on women. So it's not only just a cosmetic issue or, or, you know, something that deals with beauty and beauty standards, it also has repercussions that deal with health. So when you think about this, even we had people testify from the funeral services industry that said, after you are deceased, if you use relaxer for so long, if they peel back your scalp, there is like a green sludge that is under the scalp of a lot of African-American women that is known to cause cancer. Wow. So a lot of, you know, uh, carcinogens that are in these chemicals can be going into, can go into your scalp after you're using this for repeated years. So even one of our fellow uh, members happens to be married to an African-American woman. And he said, you are absolutely correct because his wife had uh, cancer and it, one of the thoughts was that it was caused by her utilizing hair relaxer. So these are things that, you know, people don't think about when it, and some of the repercussions that you say, oh, just fix that. It's just hair. Well, nobody tells other uh, women of other races or, or ethnicities to change their hair. Um, and I think that's one of the biggest things that we have to look at. This is an equity issue. Um, it hurt me a lot last summer when I looked and when we first introduced the Crown Act to see the young man from New Jersey who was wrestling and had to, they stopped the wrestling match. And, and he was humiliated, exactly, and cut his hair. When, as a, a former student athlete, if you're a wrestler, they check these things before you start a wrestling match. So the fact that he was clear to wrestle, and then it was like, oh no, your hair's too long. And then all of the, you know, attention that's focused and heaped on him, that he could either be disqualified or forfeit his match or have his hair cut, was something that said, no, this is being used as a weapon once again. 
the same thing happened when you looked at, uh, you mentioned um, women in the workplace. What about young girls in schools? So this is something that, you know, occurs all the time when you look at how girls are pushed out of education in a lot of ways because of how they choose to wear their hair. There right. are school policies in different areas that say you cannot have, you know, color in your hair. You can't have hair that's a, but a certain length. It has to be at your shoulders or, you know, other things like that. So here you are policing yet again what young girls and women can do in the workplace. And it's not just, I know we focus a lot on women, but I'm thinking about men too that wear their hair in locks. Um, that has become a big issue in the and workplace. And their hair is long, and sometimes it's like it can't go past the collar, things of Absolutely. that nature. So Absolutely. it's all very interesting, and we're quickly running out of time. So far, I believe seven states, including California, New York, New Jersey, Maryland, Virginia, Colorado, and Washington State have all passed legislation. Uh, as we wrap up, uh, where do we stand? How close are we to passing this bipartisan legislation in Wisconsin? Well, we got as far as a hearing in this particular legislative session. So in January, we will be reintroducing the Crown Act, and hopefully we will go through that process again and get a hearing in the Senate, um, as well as in the Assembly. And it was a bipartisan piece of legislation, and we can move forward and get that bill passed into law. So that is one of my goals starting in January, to make sure that we have that uh, introduced. Well, thank you so much for your time in educating us all today, and uh, we'll keep our eye on this act for sure. Representative Lakeisha Myers represents the 12th district in the Wisconsin State Assembly, and I should mention she is on the ballot coming up on Tuesday, August 11th for re-election. To find out more about the Crown Act, you can go to thecrownact.com. And when we return to Our Issues Milwaukee, we'll continue our discussion on hair and meet the local man who inspired the Oscar-winning short film, Hair Love. We'll do that right after this. <laughs> 